uh, let's get started. Bill, it's um, absolutely fabulous to be here. Thank you. Thanks this is a humble little facility that you have here. And getting from the hotel here was uh, longer than most people from Georgia would know how <laughs> could, could get there. But I'm thrilled to be here. You, you and your colleagues have done so much to uh, forward our knowledge. And this, this is going to be exciting to be here. So you want to introduce your esteemed colleague who you've uh, known for a little while? Dr. Roberto Lang, uh, another person, a, a pioneer in the field of, of echocardiography, particularly 3D echocardiography, Dr. Lang Roberto, is a great friend, past president of the American Society of Echocardiography, head of imaging at the University of Chicago, and uh, really an amazing speaker, will give you uh, a tour of where are we in 3D echocardiography. Uh, Roberto, it's a pleasure having you again among us. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to see Bill and, and definitely Randy, who is, in addition to many of the other things, one of the most funny echocardiographists around. So uh, it is my pleasure to uh, talk to you a little bit about the uh, advances of uh, three-dimensional echocardiography. These are my conflict uh, of interest. And uh, let me start by telling you that uh, in the year 2015, we had the opportunity to write uh, the guidelines for chamber uh, quantitation. And what was sort of interesting that in those uh, guidelines, we recommended for the first time <clears throat> in laboratories that have the experience the use of three-dimensional echocardiography to obtain uh, volumes of both the left ventricle and uh, the right uh, ventricle. Now we have, we and many others have written extensively about the advantages of 3D uh, echocardiography and I think there are predominantly two uh, main reasons. One is the fact that with 3D echo you avoid to a larger extent for shortening that you do with two-dimensional echo, and you are not dependent on a true geometry of the heart. You can truly measure a segmental sort of dilatations. Now, despite all of these papers talking about the advantage, in the majority of labs, people don't use 3D echo in order to measure volumes on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can ask yourself, there are many reasons why. It's time consuming, it, require, it requires uh, expertise, the accuracy changes according to who does it, and there is quite a lot of reproducibility between persons and institutions. And uh, here is where I would like to introduce one of the, of the new things happening in 3D Echo is, is the use of this artificial intelligence. I would like to sort of, we're gonna hear quite a lot about this because this is one of the new areas. And I would like to define artificial intelligence as that ability that you provide, you teach or train a computer to learn and then the computer will try to solve a problem for which it has not been explicitly programmed. So let's assume for example, that you take and you train a computer, you show the computer many, many, many pictures uh, of Picasso. And then you confront the computer with a particular photograph, and then the computer with all the information it has will actually, um, will actually, uh, let me just go back, uh, sorry, will actually make a drawing as if Picasso would have drawn that particular photograph. And that takes us, takes us to the fact that I had the opportunity to work for many years training a computer in which you take a full volume 3D data set, and as I'll show you in a minute, a computer will automatically find the borders and define the borders of this data set in end diastole and uh, in end systole. And in order to do that, you train a computer by providing it thousands of 3D data sets. The computer then learns to create a generic model of the heart. Then the computer does 
a local adaptation to that particular heart that it is confronted in order to then create a final model. It is very important that the computer is fed thousands of data sets because as we all know, the shape of the ventricle changes from a person to person. And we have patients with dilated ventricles, with banana-shaped ventricles, patients that have sigmoid symptoms, and normals that, have, that look more like a, a, like a cone. Now this, of course, this type of method, this is one of the studies, not, not going to talk a lot about the graph, but just to tell you, that when you use a computerized model that automatically does it, and then you do finer, minor corrections, the, um, the reproducibility is uh, very much improved. So one of the, of the new things now is that we have uh, trained the computer not only to obtain static uh, uh, identification of the heart, in end diastole and in end systole, but now it can actually automatically also find the cardiac cycle, the entire cardiac cycle, and it will eventually do it of the four cardiac chambers. In, up to now, we have sort of worked heavily on the left ventricle and also on the left uh, atrium. But as you can see in this image, a lot of the work has already been done for the right ventricle and also the right atrium. And as you can see here, you can see the identification of the borders from which you can create the volumes versus time of these particular curves. And uh, this not being, we have here validated this against MRI and against other three-dimensional methods. The most important thing is because I'll show you in a minute how then this shell will be used for many other things. Uh, let me show you, this is just, and now I'm changing subjects and show you one of the month. This is a, a three-dimensional echocardiogram to which we have created a view in which we have overimposed on that 3D strain. And this that looks like a candy is actually a patient with cardiac amyloidosis in which you can see that the work, this is this cherry on top that has been described in 2D. When you have this in 3D and you can modify the size and the views that you do it, it actually is also extremely uh, interesting and I think will be very useful for different uh, types of projects. Now, once you have the shell of this heart dynamically moving, I think you can start to think about a lot of other projects that you can do that would be particularly helpful to assess a remodeling, like for example, the assessment of the regional curvature. If you look at the shell, the shell is made by a, a certain nodes that are described, as you can see here. If you take a computer and take every node of these and you fit tangentially to that node, the circle, and you take the inverse of this radius, you're measuring regional curvature. And you can see that a, a ventricle that is functioning very well has a short radius. A ventricle that is much more dilated has a longer a radius. And you can see that from this, you can actually then paint the curvature on the ventricle. And you can see, for example, if you compare a normal versus a dilated ventricle, you can see that a septum here has a negative, uh, you know, convex and becomes concave as you dilate. And you can see also changes in the apical portion. This is a patient who underwent an anteroceptal wall MI. But I'm very excited, this is something that will be published in, in Jack uh, soon, is to show that three-dimensional longitudinal strain and three-dimensional echo, echo, uh, ejection fraction are better than the 2D counterparts to predict outcomes. But also importantly is changes in these two particular areas, the base of the septum and the apex, actually also have a bearing regarding survival of these patients. The same sort of practice can be done 
on the right ventricle, which you can also uh, measure the curvature. This is more complex because of the crescentic shape of the, ve of the left ventricle. And here you see a, a normal subject. And we have also tried to see whether this remodeling has some sort of bearing to the outcomes. And again, with the right ventricle, we can see that there are differences in curvature when you compare survivors versus non-survivors. So eventually, as you look into the future, if all of this can be done in an automated or semi-automated way, it would be, of course, a, of great interest. I'd like to take just uh, the last five minutes of my talk to talk to you a little bit about the future of, uh, of 3D Echo, just to give you a glimpse. And in addition to this automatic intelligence, I think we are going to see a lot of new rendering type of algorithms in order to improve the display of a 3D data set. And I think that a lot of that is what's going to happen into the future are these new algorithms. I think that the transducers have improved so much that not only will be able to measure volumes from the left and right side, but we will also start to find a lot of pathology. These are all examples of patients obtained from the transthoracic point of view. You can very nicely see a prolapse, a perforation. You can see a tricuspid valve with a lead that impinges its closure. You can actually see a bicuspid, tricuspid valve, et cetera, et cetera. So the quality of transducers are improving uh, tremendously. One of the other things that we have seen already and will improve is this ability to do this fusion imaging. This is an example of putting two modalities together in order to enhance and augment the type of information that you can provide. And this is fusion imaging between 3D echo together with a, a X-ray that you do during a procedure. And this is an example, you can see a ring, you can see a perivalvular leak, and you can see that this is also overimposed here with fluoroscopy guiding the interventionalist. This to show you how good this fusion is. You can see here a catheter, and when it's fused in the cone of view of the 3D echo, you can see the complete overimposition of the 3D echo on top of the catheter. There are many things that will be fused. This is an example of some of our work in which we are doing some fusion, and you can do, in this case, 3D strain, but you could do curvature, you could do displacement, and we are trying to overimpose, in this particular example, 3D strain with coronaries, and in this particular example, the use of CT of the coronaries with perfusion imaging. Another thing that, that is happening now, and this institution is one of the leaders, is in the use of a variety of uses for uh, 3D printing. And I'm going to leave you uh, with this because I'm sure you're going to hear uh, quite a lot more. But just as an appetizer, we have been working a lot with uh, TomTech in order to develop this uh, virtual reality. This is a computer-generated simulation of 3D image that can be interacted by a person using a special electronic equipment like helmets or gloves. And uh, first of all, let me tell you, this is much more fun than reading echoes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, the second uh, thing is just to it's tell you that this has been <laughs> used tremendously for the <laughs> gaming industry, <laughs> but also for the yeah, sex industry. Yeah, no. and, uh, the, the amount of things that you can uh, potentially see, you're going to see a, a demonstration here tomorrow, but this is a virtual reality. You have to imagine that you have your glasses and you're seeing this heart completely surrounding you. You can see the left and the right ventricle, and you can see now that you can actually go inside the left ventricle. And this is a patient that has a prosthetic valve, and you will see one of the struts that is actually uh, occluding the left ventricular alpha tract. And then if you can see there, you can see actually the coming of the pulmonic veins, so you can actually go into the left uh, atrium. This, of course, can also be done with uh, three-dimensional 
ECHO data sets, and this is one of the first ones. Uh, this is a patient that has a mitral valve uh, cleft. We are putting it, and you can see it. You, you know, when you see it with a screen, it doesn't really give because you have to see that with these eyeglasses in order to understand how you can interact and go into the data set. Just to finish now, let me tell you that another thing that is going to happen with 3D echo is holography. Uh, when you start working on this, you first see that Dennis Gabor in 1971 got a Nobel Prize for the description of holography. And believe it or not, this is the image that he presented. Imagine getting a Nobel Prize for this image. <laughs> and uh, he was one of the uh, first ones. He actually said this very good phrase, which is, you cannot predict the future, but you can create the future. That was Dennis Gabor. This holography is an advanced form of photography that allows an image to be recorded in, in three dimensions. And this already has been starting uh, to work. And you can see that this, differently to the virtual reality, everybody can interact because you can see the heart floating. You can actually cut it. The idea is to incorporate that into the uh, interventional uh, lab. And of course, you can rotate, you can slice that image, you can mark it, and you can measure it. So I think that it is clear that we as echocardiographists will be doing virtual surgery on a computer, and maybe that will increase our salary, finally. <laughs> uh, but again, just to finish, some of the promises and perspectives is that uh, we have shown that 3D echo is feasible. It improves the accuracy of our measurements and the reproducibility. And I think we have learned quite a lot of mechanistic insights. As we move into the future, we are going to improve our temporal and spatial resolution. We're going to improve the integration of all of this into clinical practice. This has to become automated. We need to establish outcomes to advance echocardiography. Costs need to be decreased, and what we are definitely going to see in the next year is a lot of these printings and newer ways to uh, display three-dimensional echocardiography. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Fabulous as always.